about two and a half miles east of Multnomah is this gorge. Samuel Lancaster was the man who designed the highway. He decided where it was going to go. And his premise was you find the most beautiful places and you arrange for the highway to go right by those places. He wanted his people to travel by this gorge. There are plants growing in there that don't grow anywhere else on the face of the earth. It has its own little ecosystem. If you'd like to go back and see the waterfall, it's about a half a mile back. You wade in the creek for a while, and then you come out on dry land again. And then you climb over a great big log jam that happened in 1996. And you maintain three points of contact at all times when you're doing that. Um, when you get past the log jam, you wade in the river or in the creek again. And pretty soon, if you go in the fall when the river's low, it's up to your hips at least. That's how high it hits on me, and I'm five foot six. And you go back in, and then there's the waterfall. It's very exciting and very beautiful. But if you don't care to do that, at least you can look at the beautiful gorge. This is the bluff just past where that gorge is. Highway went through here, right over this way is the gorge that you just looked at. And here is the railroad track, right there. No place else that they could go. So they had to go through the bluff. They didn't really want to. They found that they had to put, um, pump cement into a lot of cracks in order to stabilize it before they could do it. And then eventually they found that that wasn't enough. This is what that same bluff looked like in 2006, at the beginning of summer. Right there is the tunnel. That's the top of the tunnel right there. They backfilled it in the 1930s when they dredged the river, and there was enough land then for the railroad to move their trains. You don't usually ask the railroad to do things for you unless you're pretty well convinced that you can get it to happen because they don't like that. <laughs> but they did. In this case, they moved their trains out about 15 feet, if I remember, possibly more. Yeah, it would have, would, would have been a, more than that. But they moved the tracks out. And so the road then bypasses right out here. And this tunnel was backfilled. However, in 1906, they started, uh, they cut down the trees that were growing there. See this big tree trunk? That's the roots right there. That tree was growing right out of there. Um, and they opened it up. They lined it for safety. And it's open now as a part of the hiking and biking trail. Uh, you can't drive cars through it unless it's a special occasion. And then you can drive antique autos through it. This is what it looks like now from the other end. Up here at the top of the picture, you see that arched railing? And if you've driven the highway, you recognize that's pretty iconic. Pretty much, you see a lot of that up in there. That's where the original highway went. In 1933, the government decided to do something about the Great Depression that we were in. They decided that people needed electricity and people needed jobs, and we could hire a bunch of men to build a dam on the Columbia to produce electricity. and for flood control, so they began Bonneville Dam, which opened in 1937. When they built it, because it was such a massive project, they had to reconstruct everything that was there. They just, they tore apart all the land and redid what was there. Whoops. Right here is a tunnel. Let me back up one more. Right there is the beginning of a tunnel they're going to put through. This is that tunnel. And here, you see the railroad tunnel, the tunnel that went through for the cars, and up above, the historic highway. This tunnel right here is still there. Does that look familiar? It's not white and clean like that now. It's got ivy growing on it, and it looks old and tired and soot covered. This is the tunnel that you go through when you're on I-84 eastbound, right before you get to Eagle Creek, which is right near Bonneville Dam. 70 miles an hour, most people go through that tunnel now. <laughs> in 
I can't remember the year. Oops. They lowered the uh, the floor of the tunnel three feet, which in effect raised the ceiling, allowing for higher profile vehicles to get through there. This is called Shell Rock Mountain, and it really is that steep. That looks pretty steep and scary, and yes, that's exactly how it is. On the opposite side of the river is Wind Mountain. They are twins, geologically speaking. Getting a road across here was not easy. In the 1870s, what? There. Right down here, you can see a little bit of road. That's left from the 1870s. The part over here was destroyed in time, but some places it did hold. At the bottom, You see the freeway, and there's a railroad there, but you can't see it real well because there's no train on it. Right here and over here, you can see a wall. When you drive by this place, it's about at mile marker 52, when you drive by there, you're driving just inches away from this wall, and that mountain is what the wall is holding back. <laughs> This is what it looked like when it was first finished. Here we have a retaining wall, and you can see that this is up pretty high compared to the stuff that might want to slide down on it. And over here, that arched railing that's so famous. This was the first place in the United States that the arched railing was used, and then it became the standard for scenic highways. Columbia River Highway was the first scenic highway in the nation. This is what that same place looks like from the other side just a few years later. See how that rubble has come down and is wanting to come across. This is what it looks like today. This is back behind that wall that we were looking at. And that right there is the retaining wall. Lichens growing all over it. Here is the little bit of road that we saw in an earlier picture. And here's that old 1870s road. Parts of it still there, and you can get up there and walk on it if you're adventuresome. This is the bridge at Eagle Creek. And it's beautiful, isn't it? It's like a postcard. <laughs> yeah, it does look like a postcard. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think this picture came off a postcard. <laughs> Okay, I'm pushing the forward button and nothing is happening. <laughs> is there a lock on it? Did I have a lock button? the Mitchell Point Tunnel. And most of you young people in here are old enough to remember the Mitchell Point Tunnel. It had five windows in it. Um, they, they closed it in 1954 and backfilled it. But isn't this interesting? You'll notice there is a ladder down there. Get my other pointer. Okay, this ladder here is how they were getting in there to build that. That's crazy. There, there was um, a viaduct that was built coming towards us from the picture. Why didn't they build the viaduct first so that people wouldn't have to climb up the ladder? I don't know. But that's what happened. This is what the tunnel, whoops. This is what the tunnel looked like when it was finished. This is the fifth window, the easternmost window, and you could go out here. There was a little stairway that went down a little ways and a little viewing place. I remember as a child, we would come through the tunnel, park the car, go back in and go down that little thing, and I remember sitting out there having either a meal or a snack, I don't remember, but yeah, people did things like that back then. <laughs> This is what the tunnel looked like from the river. 
here we have what's called a half bridge. This is the viaduct that went over the big open space that we saw. The west portal, the five windows grouped one, three, and one. And here's the little viewpoint and picnic place. And the um, west or east portal is right there, but it's you can't see it. It's around the edge. This is what the same thing looks like today. Here's the, the railroad and the freeway. Here is the place where the road is. This is where the viaduct was. This is where the tunnel was. And then this is the road as it continued. And it's gone. They blasted it in 1966. Some people said the reason was that it was dangerous and they didn't want it throwing rocks down. They were gonna build a nice new freeway down here and they didn't want people to be killed by rocks coming down. Other people said it was a travesty. Whatever it was, it's gone. It is no more. However, we're working on putting a hiking and biking trail all the way from Troutdale to the Dalles. And much of that has been done already. There's only 11 miles left to go. And one mile of it is that section that we just looked at. They are hoping to put another tunnel. It will have windows in it. And it will not be for vehicles, it'll be for hikers and bikers. Going a little bit farther east, they had another situation between Hood River and Mosier that was very difficult. They wound up again, deciding to go with a tunnel. This is the longer tunnel, the easternmost of the two, and it has windows in it. They're a little different. The windows in the Mitchell Point Tunnel were right there. You felt like you could put your hand out the car window and touch them. Well, the whole tunnel was only 17 feet 5 inches wide, so maybe you could. <laughs> this one has tunnels that lead off to the side that have windows in the ends of them. And you can walk into this one. It's only 3 quarters of a mile. You start at Mosier and walk in. This picture is taken out one of those windows. Down here is Chicken Charlie Island, or if you're familiar with that name, or its official name is 18 Mile Island. And over there, the Mosier Anticline, or the uh, Bingen Anticline. Uh, great, beautiful geology all through the gorge. So there were Italian stonemasons who did a lot of the work, the rock work. They knew what they were doing. Um, I was just visiting with a gentleman and his mother and telling about um, how uh, some family member had come back from having lived in Italy for a while and, and traveling to Columbia Gorge said, this is just like Italy. And the rock work was probably a large part of that. Up on top, you see those pointy rocks? Those are called guard rocks. And they were intended, they say, to make the driver feel more secure. I do not feel secure when I'm driving along and have those things looming at me. <laughs> but there they are. <clears throat> One of the walls, after about 100 years of wear, was starting to give way. And so they replaced it, ODOT replaced it. You'll notice they have rock behind in baskets. The Italians did not use baskets, but they very carefully placed all the rock behind and the rock that showed. The walls were very thick at the bottom and slanted back toward the thing that they were holding up. And it was all scientific. These men had trained for many years um, under their fathers or some other stonemason to learn this skill. This is again so you can see the rock wall. But isn't that cool seeing those little cars go along there? This particular point is called Bishop's Cap. It's right past um, Shepherd's Dell. So those original Italian stonemasons had um, two requirements. One was the walls were to have arches in them, arched openings, so that they could go they could um, 
the water would drain out and we wouldn't have to deal with that because water destroys roads. That is the biggest enemy of a road. Second was they would have a cap on the top for the same reason. to keep, uh, It was a cement cap and it was to keep the water from going down in at all. So if you, the next time you drive the gorge, start looking at those stone walls and you'll notice the arches are different shapes. You'll have one section where they're wide and little arch and then you go to another section and they'll be like this. The arches are different so each mason would pick a design that was pleasing to him. He also used whatever rock was close by. Sometimes that was rubble, rounded stuff. Sometimes it was bigger blocks of uh, basalt that they would cut to fit. This is actually a fairly new wall compared to most of them. But look at that. See how he's used the sliver rock that was available in an up and down configuration. In this regard, he was exactly like the old stonemasons. He used the art that he had in him. He found something that pleased him artistically and chose to use that. I like that. We saw that. That big white rock there is what's called an erratic. It's near Mosier. It's in an old gravel pit that they're gradually trying to restore, bringing back um, trees and things to plant in there. That rock came from northern Idaho. And some of you may have heard of these massive Ice Age floods that came through the Columbia River Gorge. And um, over 900 feet high, they scoured and scrubbed things. That's why we have so many waterfalls. It's called a hanging valley where a creek used to flow down like this, you cut off a section by forcing a lot of water through there and it comes down like this and goes over the edge. That's how the waterfall gets created. So that's just one. There are erratics that you can find clear down in the Willamette Valley that show uh, evidence of coming from someplace else. And then there's this thing called gravity. And it tends to pull the hillsides down. This house is located at mile marker 35 on the, high, on the freeway. And the house sat there for probably 80 years. And then one day in 1996, a landslide occurred behind the house and pushed it out like this. Right here, that's the wood stove. It was 40 feet in front of the house. Back here in the house, the lady's purse, which was on the floor beside the wood stove, was still in the house afterwards. <laughs> the house is still there. It's never been restored. You can't see it now unless you stop and get out of your car and walk up there. But um, that's because the alder trees have grown up in front of it. This is a really cool thing. See, whoops. See this thing down here? That's a big <clears throat> magnet. And this truck would drive around, they called it a nail picker. Oh. <laughs> it would drive around and pick up all this stuff that rattled loose on those old cars. And uh, they had fewer flat tires because of it. They did, did not have steel pelted radials. <laughs> this was invented by a Washington State person, you'll be very proud, um, a student at uh, Washington State University. That photo was taken, I believe, in 1929. Um, and I don't know what year they started using it. I think around 20. Oops. This is the Lateral Bridge. And they had a problem here, very steep canyon. And it had a lot of silt on the sides. They couldn't find bedrock. They went down over 50 feet and still could not find bedrock. So they built a very light, airy sort of bridge. And in those days, that was kind of unusual. But this bridge, you, it just doesn't have much weight to it. You see a lot of space in it. Those, um, whatever you call those upright things on bridges, they go way down there. Also, see back there? Little tiny bridge goes like this, up and down. Very pretty. They built that because Mr. Talbot, who owned the land there, on both sides of the highway had given a script for the highway. He said, yes, you may use my land to build your highway on, but I want to get to my land on the other side without having to dodge these cars that are racing by here. 
he was afraid for his life, and so they built him a little bridge. This is uh, a medallion that was put in the road. It says, Warrenite Bitulithic Pavement, and a patent number. Paved roads. This was like the teenage years of road building. If you had uh, horses pulling buggies or wagons, those had iron tires on them. And they would make the road out of rock, fit the rocks together, and those iron tires would beat that rock and break it and make little dust. And mixed with rainwater, that dust would cement those little pieces together, and that's how they got their hard roads. Well, if you have rubber tires, that doesn't happen. You need a solid surface. So they were experimenting, and Sam Lancaster, the man who, the genius behind the whole thing, he had done extensive experimenting and decided that this was the way to go, and so that's what they used on it. And it was very far-sighted. I want to read this to you. The author believes the beautiful is as useful as the useful. When you have motored through the gorge of the Columbia, over the broad highway, you will understand how it is possible to combine the two for the pleasure and benefit of the children of men. Samuel C. Lancaster, 1919. <coughs> I'm going to leave that picture up there because you'll be interested when I read about him in the book. Um, okay, so I thought what I would do is read you a few little places. Uh, before I buy a book, Anyway, I like to look at it and see, is this, like, are the sentences too long and the words too big, or is it a little children's book, or what do we have here? So I can tell you, um, I write kind of like a talk, which is pretty common. But the research on this book was very scholarly. I, I didn't take the privilege lightly of researching this, and I researched it for 10 years, and um, then I wrote about it in a very common sort of way. So I start out the book with um, mini biographies of a number of the people who uh, had a part in it. This one is named Samuel Lancaster. He was born in Mississippi, raised in Kentucky. After graduating from high school, that's wrong, he was raised in Tennessee, Jackson, Tennessee. <laughs> After graduating from high school, Sam attended Southwestern Baptist University, now Union University, where he studied engineering. At the end of his first year, the funds running low, he enrolled in the School of Real Life Experience and went to work for the Illinois Central Railroad. It is perhaps surprising to find extreme engineering skill and a reverence for beauty and the God who created it in the same man. But Samuel Lancaster was most definitely that man. Sent to work in the Yazoo Delta region in West Mississippi, Lancaster continued to refine and build on his engineering skills. It was here, where the famed Casey Jones was later to meet his fate, that Sam Lancaster nearly lost his life. While working on a railroad grade, he and several co-workers became deathly ill after ingesting contaminated water. Two of the men died that night. Sam and one other man were shipped home to hopefully recover. And recover he did. At least he recovered from the typhoid fever that had laid him low. But just as the doctor was about to pronounce him well, Sam was attacked by another fearsome disease, infantile paralysis. Known today as polio, this disease had no known cure and was every bit as much a death sentence as typhoid. As the illness swept over his body, Sam gradually lost the use of his limbs. The doctor said there was no hope of recovering the loss of function and poked needles under Sam's nails to prove that the nerves were dead but the nerves were not dead. <laughs> Sam howled in pain, and the doctor quickly retreated. Unfortunately, neither the doctor nor anyone else had the slightest idea of how to help Sam recover the use of his body. No one, that is, except Sam himself. This man is the man who wrote that. I can't write like that, and I've never had polio. <laughs> I'll read you a little bit about Sam Jackson. There are uh, a number of people in here that you're familiar with, but Sam Jackson is called the Journal Man. Um, 
Before Jackson, oh, at this time he was living in Pendleton, where I live. Uh, he was born and raised over in um, Pennsylvania, and he came west and decided he wanted to be a printer, took up printing. Before Jackson, the newspaper had been typical of a young, raw western town. The reporting was slanted, and the editorials were shamelessly ignorant, prejudiced, and some, sometimes downright hateful. Sam Jackson changed all that. His take on the newspaper business was, print the truth, fight for the right. People like a fighting newspaper. Jackson was a young man of integrity, and he expected others to measure up to that same standard. He was neither afraid of hard work, nor ashamed to save a penny. His editorials called others to those high principles. He was a Democrat and insisted that the paper would always remain a voice for the Democratic Party. He took the side of the poor and downtrodden against the rich and powerful. He had a great sense of humor, coupled with a quick wit and strong opinions. At one point, after changing the masthead of the paper, he wrote, we respectfully invite the criticism of the press, and the man that writes something that does not suit us, we will send him our mother-in-law's picture in a frame. <laughs> Fortunately, Sam was not yet married. <laughs> Oz West uh, became governor of Oregon. He was the man who was governor at the time of the highway's construction. He was um, a common sort of guy. Uh, his parents were not educated. He would rather not be educated, thank you very much. Uh, but anyway, there was a man who was of a higher class of people in our classless society who felt that Oz West, Oswald West had something to offer his fellow Americans. So this man kind of took him under his wing, got him work at a bank, and eventually prodded him to run for uh, governor. By the time he was promoted to teller, he knew enough to realize that his books needed to balance at the end of the day. <laughs> when presented one day with a check for $2,750, he paid it, and then had second thoughts. After all, $2,750 was a lot of money. And how was he to know whether the man had funds to cover the check? He left the bank, checked with the presenter's attorney, and promptly decided action was needed. Here is his account of the incident. I lost no time in grabbing my hat and six-shooter. I, I was able to head the gentleman off before he caught his train. I backed him into a nearby saloon, made him straddle a whiskey barrel, and went through his pockets, recovered the loot, and was able to balance my cash that night. <laughs> That's the kind of folks we have for governor in Oregon. <laughs> so there was a place called Chanticleer Inn. It was up on a bluff, fairly near Vista House, if you know where Vista House is, or directly above Rooster Rock, if you happen to know where that is. But getting to Chanticleer was not only an adventure, sometimes it was a real pain in the neck. On more than one occasion, Margaret Henderson, who was the proprietor there, climbed the road in the snow carrying supplies on her back. That is from the river up to the bluffs, which was close to 800 feet. And sometimes people were marooned there for days at a time. Chanticleer was just about perfect in every way but one. It needed a good road. Margaret haunted the offices of the Portland Highway officials promoting her cause. So she was one more person who had a hand in making this highway happen. The moving of bureaucracy may have been slower than Hill and some others wanted it. Sam Hill, a man that I didn't read about, partly because some of you already know some things about him, and partly because I'm not going to read you the whole book, I want you to buy it. <laughs> the moving of bureaucracy may have been slower than Hill and some of the others wanted it, but finally the critical day arrived, Wednesday, August 27th, 1913. This was the day things really started popping, and Margaret Henderson got to be a part of it. 
Sam Hill hosted a luncheon meeting that day at Chanticleer Inn. Included were Multnomah County's new advisory board on roads and highways, as well as the county commissioners and local backers, Bowlby, Simon Benson, Sam Jackson, Henry Pittock, John Yon, Henry Wemmy, Margaret Henderson, and several others. Hill brought along his protege, Sam Lancaster. After a delightful chicken dinner, the men adjourned to the parlor to discuss business. They agreed to begin construction on the automobile highway through the gorge of the Columbia. The commissioner's decision to move forward was unanimous. It was one of those magic moments when preparation met opportunity. At the end of the meeting, Sam Hill turned to their hostess. Mrs. Henderson, he announced with his usual pomp, you shall have your highway. <laughs> so one of the county commissioners was named Philo Holbrook, and he was also the uh, road commissioner for Multnomah County. There was an existing road leading east toward the top of Large Mountain, but Philo Holbrook, the county surveyor who had run the line from Bonneville to the eastern edge of Multnomah County, had also tried, without success, to find a route from Chanticleer to Bridal Vale by way of the Large Mountain Road. The only road existing there at the time boasted a roller coaster worthy 22% grade. <coughs> Holbrook felt he could improve that to only 12%. Still, more than double what the new Oregon State Highway Commission had set as the maximum allowable grade. According to Holbrook, 5% was out of the question. It couldn't be done. And he was right. It couldn't be done if you took the Larch Mountain Road. But Sam Lancaster said, watch me. And he did it. The Mitchell Point Tunnel, probably the most <coughs> iconic part of the historic Columbia River Highway. I want to I want to read you what its uh, engineer wrote about one of the events connected with the construction. Sam Lancaster, and you'll notice I'm saying his name Lancaster instead of Lancaster. His great granddaughter told me he always pronounced it Lancaster. And I said, okay, I will be very careful. So I want you guys to do that too. <laughs> so he was overseeing the entire uh, segment through Multnomah, Hood River, and Wasco counties. But he had an engineer, one of his former students, working under him in Hood River County. And that's the man who was going to design this tunnel. That's the man who writes here. His name is Elliot. <coughs> Only small sections could be blasted at one time, so the rubble could be removed before the next scheduled train passing. Remember, directly below that tunnel cliff, there was a railroad track. After many days of wasted time firing one small shot after another, and stopping in between to cover, uncover, and clear the tracks, permission was granted to fire one large shot and pay the railroad to clear its own tracks with power equipment. The event was scheduled for Monday, May 10th at noon, immediately following the passage of the eastbound train. On May 9th, the railroad moved in an extra gang in anticipation of the event. The blasting went as planned. The cleanup did not. The maintenance engineer for the railroad, using both railroad employees and road workers, was supposed to have the tracks cleared by 6 p.m. Elliot noted in his report, by the following morning, 12 passenger trains and the fast mail were waiting in the vicinity of the point, and freight trains were sidetracked for miles back. When the first train went by, it was 47 and a half hours after the shot had been fired and Mitchell Point had been put on the map. <laughs> The people in Hood River County had not wanted the Mitchell Point Tunnel. They said it was a bad idea, and Elliot had Lancaster's go ahead, and they decided to build it anyway. 
when all the trains were stopped because of the rubble on the track, the people in Hood River were shouting, we told you so, <laughs> but they were wrong. So I've read just a few sections to give you a little bit of an idea. I would um, be glad to answer questions if anybody has questions. Yes, sir. Uh, you said uh, that they were going to redo the uh, road as much as possible from Troutdale to the Dalles. And I've driven as much of it, or we've driven it as much as we possibly can, and we've also walked some of it. It's still going to be that Troutdale to Hood River, I mean, to, to the Dalles Road is going to incorporate what's already there, isn't it? It's not going to be a completely new road, is it? No. Um, the waterfall section, which terrifies me. Every time I drive through there, I keep looking for bikes. I don't want to hit a biker. Um, but that remains the same. Also, the section from Mosher into the Dalles remains the same. That's the Rowena part. Um, all of that remains the same. Some of the hiking, biking parts uh, have been completed already. Well, there's the one out of Hood River, but how, how far does that go now? Um, when you go out of Hood River, you go up what's called the Hood River Loops, right. up to the top, and at the top, that's where the driving portion starts. Then you can hike the five miles to Mosier up there, or bike. One time I was up there and a lady came by me on those inline skates with the oh, silent yeah. wheels. Yeah. Scared the living daylights out of me. I didn't know she was coming. <laughs> but that's just the, the walking, biking part. Mm -hmm. right. okay. So it will be either or. Yes. Now, uh, now, how was this financed again? Okay, each county had to pay for it themselves. Multnomah County um, had a lot of help. They had a lot of rich people who lived there. They had a lot of people who lived there. And they were excited about it. They loved to go out to Multnomah Falls. They loved to go to Chanticleer. Um, not everybody loved to. The poorer people couldn't do that, and they didn't see why they should be taxed to provide a playground for the wealthy people who could buy automobiles. But all of that sifted out and worked out, and Multnomah County was in pretty good shape. Hood River County, not so much. They had not nearly as many people. Um, the creators of the road insisted all along that it was a farm to market road, when in actuality it was a playground for the rich. <laughs> Although the farmers got to use it too eventually. So in Hood River County, Simon Benson, a wealthy timber magnate, and you'll read about him in the book. Um, he went to the people and said, look it, we need to get this road through here. Tell you what, you put up a $75,000 bond and anything that's not sold at, in the first month or first period of time, whatever, he said, I will buy it. So they voted for their bond issue and he bought up the whole thing before anybody else had a chance to. So that took care of Hood River County. So Multnomah County, Hood River County were completed in two years because they didn't have to get all the permits and things like we do today, you know, to check and see what little critter is living there that we have to be careful not to kill them. Wasco County, where the Dalles is located, that was hard. Simon Benson had done his thing and he had done way more than just that one thing. Um, and People in Wasco County were mostly outlaws. Um, there were probably a few that weren't, but they, they were not too keen on the idea. The road didn't get completed through Wasco County until 1922. It just took that long to get it through. And it was money. Anybody else? Yes. So where to go from Wasco County? Didn't it connect then to Idaho yeah. sometime? Yeah, it, it went to Pendleton. That was the end of the Columbia River Highway from Astoria to Pendleton. Okay. Um, at Pendleton, it met up with the old Oregon Trail, which was not really a road. But um, <laughs> Oregon Trail runs right between my house and the river. Mm -hmm. I live right in the middle of town, and there's probably 60 yards from our house to the river and the Oregon Trail runs by there. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that you would enjoy driving on. <laughs> what about the lower end of the highway, like through uh, near Kelso and on down to the coast? Is that part of it also? Was that, is that a separate deal? They, they followed the river, so they came, but they were on the Oregon side, of course. They came north from Portland, followed the river out, 
Astoria is the official end. In the beginning, there was some talk about making it seaside and cutting straight across. Um, and there's a gentleman, I have some postcards and business cards on the back table from a guy named Aaron Litt. And he's doing a project called Recreating the Historic Columbia River Highway. And when I first discovered him, what he was doing was he, he would look at the old photos and say, okay, I recognize this is near such and such a mountain, or I, I recognize this. And he'd go and walk around till he found the exact spot where the picture was taken, and he would take a new picture. Mm -hmm. So that was really fun. But he's been doing a lot of research on this. He's coming out with a, a video project, uh, probably the video project first and then the book later. But if you are interested in that, you can find him online. Um, he's on Facebook, and I also have a little card back there, a little orange card that tells um, my email address and my Facebook and my website. So if you're interested, you can pick one of those up. Well, was that Highway 30? Yes. In the extension? Mm -hmm. It was called 30 for a long time, and now I-84 is also called 30. You know, they, they move the designation to whatever is the most modern road in the area that goes from point A to point B. But yes, that was Highway 30. Well, if everybody's satisfied, take out a pencil and paper, we're ready to have a test. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about who you are. What? Oh, all right. My name's Peg Willis. Um, I graduated from R.A. Long. Um, I live in Pendleton now. My husband and I have three boys, and they're wonderful and extremely talented and good-looking. I have three daughters-in-law who are just charming girls. I adore them. And we have seven grandchildren, each of whom is perfect. Um, I have been teaching music for over 50 years. I've also taught school. I was a school principal for a while. Um, I've written for uh, magazines and newspapers. This is my first book. Mm, I like chocolate. It goes into 40,000 words okay. and 60 pictures. There are 76 pictures in there and 42,000 words. Oh, okay. And I got away with it. So. Well, good for you.